Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here to the LAC today. Um, my name is Ricardo Reese, and I am the Phillips Professor at the Economics Department here at the London School of Economics. And we're here today to discuss the Euro and the battle of ideas. Um, our two speakers are two of the authors of a recent book, uh, The Euro and the Battle of Ideas, unsurprisingly, uh, which they have co-authored with Jean-Pierre Landau. Um, our speakers are Marcus Brunemeyer and Harold James, very distinguished, uh, respectively, economist and historian, who have written this incredibly provocative and interesting book that has really attracted an enormous amount of attention in recent, in the last month since it was released, and has, and has been endorsed publicly, not just in the usual back of the book, but also in many columns by many readers across the world as being a truly landmark um, study of exactly how the Euro was a conflict of different ideas, of different intervenience in the political atmosphere, but especially also in the academic atmosphere. The two speakers tonight are Professor Marcus Brunemeyer and Professor Harold James. Marcus Brunemeyer is the Edward Sanford Professor at Princeton University in its economics department, as well as in the Bendheim Center for Finance, which he directed for the last few years. Um, Professor Brunemeyer is also a frequent consultant and advisory in many public, at many public institutions, including the IMF, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the European Systemic Risk Board, the Bundesbank, or the Congressional Budget Office. He has many honors in his CV, among which the Bernasse Prize for the top macro finance economist in, in, of a European origin, since he is originally from Germany, as well as an incredibly prestigious Guggenheim Fellow in the United States. Perhaps his greatest honor, though, is that he is a graduate of the London School of Economics. You obtained his PhD here from the Economics Department a little over 20 years ago. In turn, Harold James is a professor of history and international affairs at Princeton University. More particularly, he is the Claude and Laura Kelly Professor in European Studies with a joint appointment in the History Department and the Woodrow Wilson School of um, International and Public Affairs. Professor James obtained his PhD in an also pretty good school, Cambridge University. Uh, after we, and after some time then of being a fellow of Peterhouse College, he moved to Princeton where he has been for 30 years. He is an expert in economic history and wrote landmark studies on both the, the history of Germany in the interwar, the history of the Deutsche Bank, as well as more recently the history and the interplay of ideas in the creation of the international monetary system as we know it and as it has evolved over time. He has earned the Helmut Schmidt Prize for Economic History, as well as the Ludwig Erhard Prize, among many, many other honors, and he is one of the most distinguished historians of the 20th century economic history today. We're very pleased to have them, and they will both speak and present their perspective on their book over the next uh, 30 minutes, after which we will open it so that uh, people can ask them questions and we can engage in a debate for the remaining 20 or 30 minutes, after which um, the book is outside for anyone who wants to go and buy it in a desk, and the authors will stay here after 7.30 uh, to sign um, autographs or just book or sign the book or just generally discuss with you a little bit more um, the content of the book. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and I give the floor to Professor Harold James. Um, mm, thanks, uh, Ricardo. Um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Yes, I haven't got a degree from the LSE, unfortunately, but uh, in fact, the LSE was evacuated to my college in Cambridge uh, during the Second World War, and some of the older fellows still remembered the evacuation of the LSE. So, um, we're thinking about this uh, this book, uh, which uh, the Euro and the Battle of Ideas, and uh, we had some slides, but they don't seem to be coming. Um, They'll just go down. Ah, yes, wonderful. Um, <coughs> We thought uh, we, we might say something about the, the origins of the book um, because, as, as Ricardo mentioned, we come from very different uh, traditions, uh, disciplines. Um, so it's not just that Marcus is from Germany and I'm originally from the UK and uh, Jean-Pierre Lando is from France, uh, but uh, Jean-Pierre Lando was a policymaker. 
Uh, Marcus is a theoretical economist. I'm a financial historian. Um, and the thing that we, we, we started working on this now five years ago, uh, and we really came to the conclusion that there was a big problem of communicating um, about economic ideas in Europe, particularly between France and Germany, and that the fundamental problems were really more to do with differences of ideas uh, than they were to do with differences of interests. Um, differences of interest, you can imagine, if people have differences of interest, they can sit around a table and somehow they can usually get a compromise. Uh, but with ideas, often they just shout at each other or even worse, just shout past each other. Uh, so um, this, I, I think, is a, a division that in particular uh, affects the, uh, both sides of the River Rhine, uh, France and Germany. Um, and the, the problem is that the French and the Germans don't speak the same language, not obviously just in linguistic terms, uh, but in terms of economic ideas. Um, and that matters, not because they're the only countries in the EU, uh, but because for a long, long time, the Franco-German relationship has been critical uh, to the development of the EU. But in particular, because in the course of the Euro debt crisis, uh, after 2010, the power shifted, and we have a long analysis of the, the, the way in which decisions are made in Europe, uh, power shifted away from the European institutions, uh, from the Commission and the Council and the Parliament, um, the Parliament never had much power anyway, uh, but from the Commission and the Council uh, to the national capitals. Maybe not surprising because in the aftermath of a financial crisis, there's a lot of demand for fiscal action and fiscal action is where the nation states come in because the EU only has a small share of the budget. But after 2010, in particular, it's just decisions that are made between France and Germany uh, that are critical. And we really begin the intensive story uh, with a meeting in Deauville on the Normandy coast in October 2010 um, when President Sarkozy and Chancellor Merkel made a kind of compromise. And um, the kind of compromise that they made is a nice illustration of the fact that compromises don't always have to be good. You can compromise and get exactly the worst aspects of both countries' traditions. And what happened in Deauville was just that, that the uh, German um, insistence was for a strict regard uh, for solvency, strict application of rules. Marcus is going to talk more about that. Um, and. Um, uh, so to have a haircut of private sector exposure uh, to the uh, problem countries in Europe um, in order to get more discipline applied uh, than was being applied uh, before because the markets hadn't really exercised any discipline um, in the big boom phase. And so the aftermath of Deauville is maybe intended, uh, was intended, that the spreads would widen. But it wasn't intended that the spreads should widen as much as they did and provoke what really became a general crisis. And the French side, why did the, the French agree to that? Uh, because France wanted a watering down of the rules on the fiscal uh, criteria for Maastricht on the debt and um, deficit uh, criteria of the M Maastricht Treaty. So a, a compromise um, that was a bad compromise. Um, uh, and uh, we then go through some watershed moments, uh, big uh, moments of d development. Um, the summer of 2012, uh, Mario Draghi's London speech, uh, where to some extent uh, the, the crisis gets put under control, and we examine the background of that also in terms of a French-German diplomacy. Um, the discussion of the bailing in of banks in Cyprus and the, then this summer after the 23rd of June, um, the aftermath of, of Brexit. Um, and um, Marcus is going to develop this section of it. Um, we, we have two sections to the analysis. One is to do with monetary and fiscal uh, stability, 
and uh, the stuff that was put into the Maastricht Treaty, and the second to do with financial stability, the stuff that was largely excluded from the uh, Maastricht criteria, although from the Maastricht Treaty, although the treaty had a kind of clause that was heavily fought over in the statutes of the ECB uh, that actually in the end is the mechanism by which the ECB has got back into financial supervision. But it was scaled back in the process of drafting when Maastricht was made. Um, so one temptation, I think, faced by this Franco-German non-understanding is to think that the differences are absolutely permanent um, because they, they come from, maybe not genetic, uh, but uh, they come from things that are really deep in the country's history. Uh, France has always been a country of centralization from the monarchy, from the Ancien Regime, through the revolution, um, uh, from Louis XIV, uh, through Robespierre to Napoleon, centralization. Um, and Germany has been, with the exception of the 13 uh, disastrous years between 1933 and 1945, has been always a country of federalism. Um, and federal countries like the United States or like Switzerland or like the Federal Republic of Germany are very legalistic entities because you need lots of laws, lots of rules to work out how the bits of the federation deal with each other. Um, but uh, that's really where our historical perspective comes in because we don't just do the history of the Euro crisis. We also want to go back into time to see really how these ideas emerged and in consequence how permanent they are. And uh, the story is really quite a surprising one um, because in the 19th century and indeed up to the middle of the 20th century, France was the country that wanted to apply rules and that had a strong concept of classic economic liberalism. So it's the country, obviously, that gives you the word laissez-faire. It's the country of the famous liberal economists, Bastiat and Say and Le Rabolieu at the end of the 19th century. Um, so classic economic liberalism in France and in Germany, a enormous belief in the state guidance of the economy. So the idea that France today is France because Colbert was there in the 17th century uh, really misses this completely. And um, the, uh, the, w w why did they change? Um, well, it's really quite simple. In the middle of the 20th century, both ideas run into a dead end. Uh, the German dependence on the state and the tradition of guiding the path of industry and dirigisme and state intervention in economic action um, looks as if it's parodied um, and taken to an extreme and a destructive extreme in the National Socialist dictatorship, in the Nazi dictatorship. And uh, you know, famously, if you think of uh, famous figures at the LSE, uh, Friedrich von Hayek made the argument that the Nazi dictatorship has its origin in the way of thinking about the, uh, the, the, the state that uh, existed in Germany in the aftermath of the First World War. Um, so in order to constrain that, you need rules, and German lawyers and economists then worked on the development of a rule-based approach. And by contrast, in France, what happened was that the orthodox policies, the policies of austerity, of deflation, reacting to the Great Depression, produced the weakness of France. And in the end, the, uh, many people started to attribute the fall of France in 1940, the military defeat by Nazi Germany, uh, to the austerity policies and the liberal economics of the 1930s, in particular the so-called super deflation had been applied by Pierre Laval, the prime minister who then later in the Vichy period becomes the principal uh, collaborator of Hitler. So in France, you move away from um, classical economic ideas and you think that the state has a role in 
galvanizing the economic performance of post-war France. In Germany, um, you move towards a system of rules. And that experience, I think, is important because it shows you that in the moment of a big crisis, there's a possibility that not only politicians, but also economists, anybody who thinks about the economy, will shift their attitude. And the kind of optimistic note that we end on is that Europe is now facing a whole series of crises, not just the debt crisis, but after 2014, the security crisis because of the annexation of Crimea and the fighting in eastern Ukraine, the disintegration of uh, uh, Syria, of Libya, uh, refugee crisis, terrorism crisis. It raises issues about Europe's energy dependence, about the inability of European countries to get a single energy market. Uh, so all kinds of crises coming up at the same time. And some people think, well, if Europe can't really solve the debt problem easily, how can it solve these multiple crises that are now hitting it and then Brexit on top of it? How can it solve all that? Isn't that the end of Europe? Um, we were just in the bookstore and I saw these very, very gloomy books that there was one obituary for the EU. Um, well, actually, those moments of crisis are moments of reflection when you really start to reformulate the ideas. And we think of our book as a contribution to doing that in showing to French people and German people where exactly how the ideas are built up, but also in proposing a way that really I, I think we would present as a way out of this intellectual impasse. So I'm going to hand, out, uh, hand over uh, for the details of this escape from the dilemma to Marcus. So thanks a lot. It's good to be back at the LSE where I was here for several years to do my PhD. So what I will do is what Harold said, you know, that ideas can shift dramatically. And we saw this uh, after 1940s where, you know, essentially France and Germany in the terms of economic philosophy switched sides radically. And that's the hopeful message that actually there can change. But as a first step, you have to figure out, you know, where are the differences. And often policymakers don't they have an intuitive feeling that they are different, but where are the differences? So we would like to go step by step in several dimensions where the differences are. So these are the four differences I want to walk through. And the first one is on discretion versus rules. And there's a, a lot of economic literature on it. And, you know, the French, they have very much the idea, you do some active crisis management, you focus on the current crisis before it spirals out of control, you want to intervene. While the Germans are very much focused on the future crisis. So if you actively manage the current crisis, you might sow the seeds for a future crisis much more. And all these ad hoc measures, the French proposing, the list of ad hoc measures, they're called ad hocery and look down on it. And they would like an autonomous system much more driven by rules where you don't have to intervene as a government. So that's essentially, they're very much focused on the current crisis while the Germans are worried about you know, causing a future crisis. And you know, the, essentially the focus is to develop a framework which is a stable framework for the future. But if you just think about discretion versus rules, I think you don't get the whole message. The French economic philosophy on this dimension is a little bit more subtle. It is not just having discretion on any dimension. It's actually, well, if you think about it, it is discretion in certain dimensions, but very strong commitment in other dimensions, what we call straitjacket commitment. You really put the shackles on in certain dimensions. So you commit the future in order to solve the current crisis. And let me give you two examples where the French really commit the future and hence have to manage other dimensions much more actively. So the two examples are, the first one is not to default on your sovereign debt. So they're very strong not defaulting. Any debt restructuring is taboo for them, much more strongly than for the Germans. The Germans are open for sovereign debt restructuring. Deauville was a classic example. From a French perspective, you never, it's essentially wholly debt, so you would never touch it and restructure it. And another dimension is essentially, if you look at the international dimension, international economics, 
The French is always open for currency packs. You fix the exchange rate across countries, or you go in the currency union. The French were the drivers to go in the currency union, and it were the French who said we don't need any exit rules. Because if you have exit rules, it might make it easier for country to get out of it. No, we have to bind them down to the extreme straitjacket commitment. The, on the other hand, the Germans are much more for floating exchange rates. In general, they're much more off the bread and woods. You see a huge discrepancy between the two views. And what are the implications? The implications, if, if you have very strong straitjacket commitments in some dimensions, you have to manage very actively in other dimensions. Okay? If you have a German system, you go for safety valves, for escape valves. So you don't have to manage, so everything is automatic because everybody's scared about the arbitrariness of the government. And that comes from you know, the Nazi uh, rule where you, that the government should not be so powerful anymore. We want to have any concentration of power. We want to promote com competition and other things in order to get rid of the concentration of power. So, but from the French perspective, you commit to very, very strict uh, commitments in certain dimensions, and then you're very flexible in managing in other dimensions. So, for example, if you commit to this currency pack or some currency union, then you manage much more the capital flows while the Germans are for free capital flows. So putting it in, this, in the face of this Mandel-Fleming dilemma everybody's talking about, is you know you can pick two of the three objectives or the des desired features you would like to have. You know you want to have an autonomous monetary policy, you want to have f fixed exchange rate or low volatility exchange rates, and you want to have free capital flows. And you can pick two out of the three at most. And France would pick you know, fixed exchange rates and autonomous monetary policy and would give up on the free cash fl uh, capital flows. Germany would actually not give up on the free capital flows. They would give up on the fixed exchange rate. So there's a different preference, a different attitude to this. Again, one country having going for safety valves, autonomous rules, and the other country not just simply for discretion, straight check commitments in certain dimensions and active discretion in other dimensions. <clears throat> so that's the first thing, discretion versus rules. And then, of course, discussion with rules that you're all familiar with. With your discussion, you get to time and consistency problems. But equally importantly, it's not only the time and consistency, it is political lobbying, the political influence. Political economy from a German economic thinking matters a lot. You know, certain groups which are better connected to the government, they will get advantages compared to other groups which are less well connected. So you would like to have an autonomous rule-based system so nobody gets an advantage and there's no concentration of power in the system. Of course, you can't have rules for everything. Particularly, you can't have rules for unforeseen contingencies. So sometimes you say, well, what should I do if there are totally unforeseen contingencies? So one way out for that, for these unforeseen contingencies, is to create some independent agencies. You split the government up in a fiscal authority, in a monetary authority, an independent central bank. And these two authorities play a game of chicken. It's like a mechanism design problem. You, know, you split one government up, and they play now some game with each other, a game of chicken. And this controls their power. And that's also Germans like this independence. It's another way, if you have unforeseen contingencies, you can't write down everything in rules. So another way to constrain the power of the government is to have independent agencies competing with each other, like in a game of chicken. And then you can relate this you know, to all the various dominance, fiscal dominance if the fiscal authority is more in the driver's seat, monetary dominance if the central bank is in the driver's seat, and we might talk later also on financial dominance, uh, in particular if you know, the financial sector has a big power. <clears throat> now, this was the first dimension, discretion versus rules. Second dimension is solidarity versus liability. The French were very open to any form of risk sharing, any form of transfers, fiscal union, commit down the road, to have a common euro bond with joint liability. And it's not a big problem to have a joint liability because your bonds won't, no sovereign bond will ever default. So if nothing is defaulting ever, you can have joint liability. It's not a big deal. It doesn't cost you much because none of these bonds will ever default. Well, the Germans are driven by the liability principle, the Haftungsprinzip. Essentially, the guy who is in control is liable. You don't separate the thing with, you know, somebody is in control of something, you're also liable for something. So this liability principle is very strong there, and that, that's the translation of the no bailout rule. That's where the Germans pushed into the Maastricht Treaty to make sure, you know, the no bailout clause, if somebody does something wrong and it goes sour, he's liable for it, there's nobody else bailing out and helping out. <clears throat> 
And you want to avoid any joint liability. And from a German perspective, sovereign debt can default. So there should be no joint liability and everybody should be uh, liable for its own action. If you move the power of spending budgets and expenditure power to Brussels, then you can have joint liability. But as long as the spending power is at the national capitals, you can't have joint liability. That's the philosophy uh, from a German perspective. The third dimension is on liquidity versus solvency. It is essentially, whenever there's some financial trouble, said it, you never know is it a solvency problem or is it a liquidity problem. It's always gray. And if it's gray, the Germans say it's a solvency problem. The, the French say it's a liquidity problem. Uh, what's a solvency problem? The net present value the expected is just negative, so it's a solvency problem. And you would just throw good money off the bad. You would never do it. You have to fundamentally fix the system. If it's a liquidity problem, uh, all what you need is a big bazooka. And this came, you know, this came out of the UK saying, oh, just show that you have a trillion dollars ready to intervene, and then the markets will fund everything again, and the whole financial problems will go away. In economic terms, it's like a multiple equilibrium story. You have two equilibria, a good one and a bad one, and you just show this big bazooka, and things will jump back to the good equilibrium. Prices will be in the high equilibrium again, and everything will be fine. So that's one liquidity problem, and that's, if you think about it, so we talked about Deauville, but another milestone essentially of the watershed moment of the financial crisis was Mario Draghi's London speech. He gave this famous speech in 2012, in the summer of 2012, where he said, I do whatever it takes in order to save the euro. And the yields came all down. And the program, the underlying program, he only developed over the summer, it was only announced and in September, the OMT, and he didn't spend a single euro. So this was essentially a liquidity problem because you didn't have to intervene any, so it was a multiple equilibrium liquidity problem. The other liquidity problems as well, when you know the demand curve here is inverted S-shaped, this means there's a lot of strategic complementarities. If I reduce the strategic complementarities, then the demand curve looks a little bit like this. If there's such a demand curve, if I shift the fundamental demand curve a little bit, the price goes up a lot. So if I put one euro in, the price might go up by 10 euros. Okay, so this is an amplification scenario instead of a multiplicity defense scenario. This amplification scenario essentially means I change the fundamentals a little bit, I bail out a little bit, put one euro in, and I get a 10 euro benefit. And you would still, yeah, that's still a liquidity problem, it's worthwhile doing. Okay, so those are the two liquidity problems. And I will come back to these liquidity problems when I go to the financial sector. Remember this was this Maastricht stepchild, things which were really not put in the Maastricht Treaty, and that's, I think, played a major role uh, then in the financial crisis, taking the banking sector into account. So the fourth dimension on the interaction between fiscal and monetary was the Keynesian stimulus versus the austerity reform. And there are two dimensions to that. First of all, from a Keynesian perspective, mostly the output gap is a, you know, you have a, the output is, here's potential, and here's output, there's a gap, and you undershoot. You have to do something push up demand to go back to potential. Okay. From a German perspective, it can be that actually output is excessive. It's just unsustainably high. It's because of credit growth is just leading to something extremely high, which is unsustainable. And it could come down and it's just a correction. You go back to a healthy path uh, rather than having being always underneath and undershooting for underneath. Some Keynesian models have negative output gap, but most of the traditional Keynesian models have this output gap where you always undershoot. So that's a difference in, in perspective. And the other difference is that the question is, when do you want to do reforms? Do you want to do it in good times or in bad times? Remember when you take your class and there's a zero lower bound and you hit the zero lower bound, a productivity enhancement is actually bad. It makes the situation worse. So you don't want to have any productivity enhancement in really at the times when you're at the zero lower bound as we are right now in Europe. And you know, reforms are actually bad. It typically reforms stir uncertainty, people uncertain, the demand less and so forth. So reforms essentially lead to less demand. So you don't want to do any reforms in, you know, in, in, a, in a recession. The Germans, they focus much more on political economy problems. Again, it's this lobbying thing and all these things. And they say, you know, 
in good times, you cannot do any reform. You can only do the reforms in bad times. When the people stand against the wall, when the TINA principle holds, there is no alternative, the TINA principle. Then you can push through reforms. And you have to use these reforms. You have to use a crisis to really make structural changes. Yes, we know this will hurt. And yes, we know it is costly. But if you don't do it now, once you're in the boom again, you won't do it then. And then you don't do any reforms. That's why let's use this crisis and make reforms, set up a more stable framework, which will help down the road uh, even further. So that's essentially, these are the four dimensions, which played already out, were very familiar in the Maastricht negotiations. And you know, that's the intersection between monetary stability and fiscal debt sustainability, or fiscal and the monetary side. But what was really the Maastricht stepchild, that's essentially the financial stability. Not that it was not discussed. Remember, there was uh, the uh, Scandinavian crisis in the early 90s and all this. So, and, you know, ES ERM had troubles and all this. But financial stability didn't enter the Maastricht, negotiate, the Maastricht Treaty so much. So why was it so much ignored? And we point out three reasons. One is finance grew way bigger than it was before. And the funding structure changed from retail funding to wholesale funding. But it was also the case that the liquidity spirals, fire sales, spillovers, and systemic risk, we only understand you know, after we did some more research on it, one could say. But it's also because we really saw how big these effects are from the Southeast Asia crisis. You know, when in Thailand things spilled out of Malaysia, and Indonesia, Korea, and you know, to, to Russia, and then to Brazil, we saw, wow, there are huge spillover effects. So that's something important. The Maastricht negotiations happened in the late 80s, early 90s. This was way before that. And the effects that, you know, your shrinking banking sector leads to less money supply. Of course, we knew this from the Great Recession, but it was not so prevalent uh, anymore then. But it became much more prevalent with Japan. But in the early 90s, Japan just, you know, the bubble in Japan just bursted. So it was very recent at that point when the experience was not absorbed yet. And these, these elements were not really so at the forefront of their minds, and that's why not, they didn't enter so much the aspect. So let's talk about this contagion, spillovers, and systemic risk. So I, we go back to liquidity and solvency now within the financial system, and now I have this you know, amplification spirals. We have this demand curve here. And you say, oh, should I bail out? What is the net present value of a bailout? And the emphasis is on net. You have to ask yourself, what's the present value of bailing out versus the present value of not bailing out? The present value of not bailing out is all about how costly is not bailing out and how much damage will the spillover systemic risk cause. And that's where the Germans and the French disagreed dramatically as well. And this really played out in the spring of 2013 with the Cyprus crisis. There was a huge debate, you know, should we bail out the Cyprus banks or not? And I still remember, you know, in the finance ministers, people saying, you know, if we bail out Cyprus, and if Cyprus is systemic, and it's all mostly Russian oligarchs who have the money there, and they have a business model of, you know, building up through light regulation and tax advantages some, uh, you know, black money from Russia, and the European taxpayers have to bail them out, then everything is systemic. We can forget the no bailout rule altogether. And the Germans prevailed in this case, and it was a bail-in in Cyprus. And the spillovers were not so severe. They were contained through, you know, capital controls and other measures. Firewalls will be put up, and the spillovers were contained. And that led to a shift from a bailout mentality to a bail-in mentality. So it radically shifted to much more bail-in. And this led to a new regulatory framework, how we deal with ba banks now, and we deal with banks in terms of much more bail-in. Of course, it's much more complicated. Now we, we have some Italian banks in difficulties, but now we have these bail-in rules, and the Germans are defending the bail-in rules. They strictly said, we made this rule framework about how to deal with troubling bank, troubled banks, and suddenly we threw it over way, over the, out of the window because um, it is the case that uh, it didn't you know, solve the problems. So that's essentially what happened in the spring 2013. There was another watershed moment. 2012 was the London speech. We had this liquidity thing. It shifted much more to the French view. 2013, it shifted much more to the, the German view with this bail-in arrangement on this. So one is the spillovers 
from across different banks and of across different countries. Another spillover occurs, of course, between sovereign risk and banking risk. So this famous diabolic loop or doom loop, as some people call it, or the nexus between governments and banking, or the deadly embrace, as some people call it, between sovereign risk and banking risk. And there are actually two diabolic loops. There's sovereign risk. If the sovereign risk is going up, but then actually the, the bank's holdings will be worth less and the bank's equity will suffer. It will be more likely the banks have to be bailed out and then the sovereign risk is going up. So this actually spirals and the sovereign risk brings problems into banking risk and the banking risk brings problems with the sovereign risk. And you don't know where it started. In Greece, it might have started on the sovereign side, bringing the banks in difficulties. In Ireland, it was the other way around. It doesn't really matter what triggers it. It just amplifies the whole thing. But there's a second diabolic loop. And the second diabolic loop is that when the banks have a lot of sovereign debt and suddenly sovereign debt suffers, but then actually the loans, the banks cut back on the loans to the real economy. And as they cut back their loans to the real economy, credit growth goes down, economic growth goes down, and tax revenue goes down. And the sovereign suffers again because the government has now less tax revenue and it is in more in difficulties. So there are two diabolic loops interplaying on this. And you know this actually plays out again. So what should we do if there is some sovereign risk? So you have some default risk on the sovereign. How should we do it? And there are two approaches from a French perspective and from a, US, a German perspective. The French perspective is it's easy. We never default on sovereign debt. We just make a straight check commitment. And how do we do it? We offer our banks as a hostage. So the way it is, whenever the sovereign is in Dublin, can't sell off its bond, we ask our banks to buy it. And when the banks have it, that's a commitment. It's a strong signal to the market. If we were to default on our sovereign debt, we would ruin our banks. And with the banks through the diabolic loop, we would ruin the whole economy. Hence, we will never default. Okay? That's a, it's, a, it's a consistent argument. No? The Germans said, no, 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 we want something different. We want the banks as an insurance providers. We, want some, we don't have an exchange rate safety mechanism anymore. We don't have a safety valve on this dimension with exchange rates. We want at least that we can occasionally, when there's extreme debt overhang, want to be able to restructure the debt. And then we should be able to do it, and the bank should have some equity cushion if this happens. So we need some risk weights on that. The French say, no risk weights. The Germans say risk weights on it. The French in a more broader sense, Italians and Spaniards and so forth. Now you could say, does this French view really hold up? And you know, the French view is, oh, we use the banks as hostage, then we never default, we get the low interest rate, and then we grow out of it because the low interest rate helps us to get out of it and grow out of it. But the problem with this is it's a doubling up strategy. If it works, it works well. If it doesn't work, then you're really deep in trouble. Okay, because you have destroyed the banking system and with it the whole economy. Perhaps you can knock on Germany's door to bail you out. But if you don't have that, you're really deeply in trouble. And was, and what I have not taken into account, is that there is also the second diabolic loop. If you ask your banks to hold all the sovereign debt, you push it onto the banks, then it will be the case that the banks uh, can't lend to the real economy anymore. And hence, the credit growth will go down, tax revenue will go down, and actually, the sovereign is in trouble nevertheless. Okay. Now, let me just say two more words to the two challenges you want to have. The French view, you want a safe asset, default-free asset. And the German view, IMF view, Anglo-American view, you want to have contingent debt. You potentially have some debt restructuring, to have some risk sharing with bondholders without this diabolic loop. And the second challenge you would like to have is to would like to have a safe asset which is provided across the European Union or across the Euro area. So it's not Germany is not the monopolist on providing safe asset. At the moment, it is really the German Bund which is the safe asset. Okay? How and then whenever there's a crisis, there's capital flow from the periphery to the core. Okay? When the crisis recedes, it flows the other way. We have a gloss, lot of cross-border flows. So Ricardo and I and a group of other Euro economists, Euronomics, the Euroeconomics group, we proposed some solution for this. You might see that's, that's it's like squaring the circle. We can't have default double sovereign debt and at the same default free sovereign asset. 
But we say you can have it, you can have it both. And how do you do it? You create something like ESPYs, European Safe Bonds. What are ESPYs? Essentially, you have some special purpose vehicle. You pool all the sovereign debt up to a certain limit. So you buy some part of the sovereign debt of each country. And you issue a senior bond, the ESPYs, and a junior bond. There's no joint liability. It satisfies the German liability principle. And it creates a safe asset because the junior bond protects the senior bond. If there's default and certain, certain countries default, the junior bond will be hit. But, you know, the junior bond will be bleeding. But until the junior bond is totally wiped out, the senior bond is safe. And you can do simulations. The senior bond is extremely safe if you make a junior bond of 30%. Uh, the senior bond 70% and the junior bond of 30%. And now the flight to safety capital flows are not across borders anymore, from the periphery to the core, but they're from the junior bond to the senior bond. And this means essentially you have capital flows from one European bond to another European bond. So it's not a cross border flow anymore. So let me conclude. I think what this book is about. It is about ideas. We argue ideas matter. It's not only about interests or incentives. It's really about ideas. The way you look at your interest is through the lens of ideas. The lens of ideas. In economic language, you have a model. You know, you can, if you have different models, you have the same situation, you come to different conclusions. Okay? And if you disagree on the model, we have to have a debate which model is the better one. We have to empirical test it or whatever. We have to have a race of the models and figure out. But first, we have to understand what models both parties have and how they differ in sense. I think that's what the book tries to do. Let's figure out the differences across these models or these lenses. There was a power shift in 2010, and that's why we focus so much on France and Germany. The power shifted with the involvement of the IMF, with the establishment of the EFSF. It moved from a supranational arrangement, everything is done in Brussels, to intergovernmental, everything is done by the capital states. With the will in the October of 2010, it shifted actually to Paris, Paris and Berlin, and ultimately lopsided to Berlin. Because at that time, the high yield spread over, and everybody knew if they make a strange statement, if they say we don't reform the country, the yields will shoot up. And if Berlin would make some noise, the yields of this country would flip, would go up. And this is a, shifted the power dramatically towards the two capitals, in particular to Berlin. I mentioned the Rhine divide, the ghost of Maastricht, things which were all in the Maastricht Treaty, stepchild of Maastricht. And at the end, we have a number of proposals in the book, among them, which is uh, related to what I did with Ricardo and others. Uh, on the SPs. And of course, we talk about firewalls and raise away from the bottoms, other mechanisms which help. And this, uh, for this, you have to buy the book and read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for those, that's truly excellent presentation. And at this point, we're going to open it to the floor. So um, there's microphones on the side. So Please put your hand up and then I'll point and I'll just ask you to, so we'll start there. I'll ask that you just say your name and your affiliation just very briefly and then keep your questions short so that we can do it. So I'll collect sounds. Good evening, thank you very much. Very interesting thoughts. Um, my name's Luke Hamill. Um, I borrow a lot of money for property business, so I'm always interested there. But uh, as an English citizen, keen to understand the impact on the UK economy, if, if it does in fact transpire that we do leave the European community, the European Union. So I'll collect three. Yeah. Eric Bergloff, LSE. So, so um, when we're in, in the midst of this crisis, uh, some of us thought that you could kind of separate the legacy issues from the forward-looking issues, and and. Um, of course, then it matters a lot, you know, when you make these decisions. So, you know, having looked back at, at um, how bankruptcy legislation happened in the U.S., it always happened in a severe crisis. And of course, if you think that political economy matters a lot, uh, it's going to look very different in, a, in the midst of a crisis. If you think that it's the game between the various uh, uh, creditors and, and equity holders that is, is the important part. It's also going to look very different 
depending on when you... So, so if you come to this with these two lenses, you know, sort of German, French, how, how, how do you see these uh, distinctions? There's going to be an election in France and Germany next year at Harrison from the London School of Economics. So how would the, the election for president in France and the election for the chancellor in Germany, how does that affect the position of, of the two countries? Yeah, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll spread the questions up, I think. Um, uh, I mean, the, the political ones, uh, um, I think many people here are obviously very, very worried about the aftermath of Brexit and what it means, and um, it's, it's really completely unclear what the negotiating strategy was immediately after the 23rd of June, and we're only just beginning to see some clarity over the last uh, week or so. Um, w one of the problems, and it's related to the final question about what happens in the politics of continental Europe, is that what happens here has an effect on Europe, and what happens in continental Europe has an effect here. In some ways, we argue uh, that the Euro crisis was one of the features that drove Brexit, and uh, the, 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 the semi-detached stance of the British political leadership, whether it's Prime Minister Cameron or Mrs. May, or for that matter, Boris Johnson or uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, they're all deeply divided about what to do over Europe. Um, and uh, in the course of the Euro crisis, this, this kind of mechanism built up where uh, the UK, uh, the Chancellor uh, George Osborne uh, was saying, you need to get more of a fiscal union if you want a monetary union to work, um, but we don't want to be part of it. And Effectively, he was saying the same thing as the U.S. Treasury, but the U.S. Treasury is clearly not part of Europe. Uh, but in effect, saying this uh, and making this kind of argument was pushing you out. Now, th th it goes directly to the, 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 the other question about what happens in France and Germany n uh, next year. Um, uh, we can think of it, I think, in terms of the... The, the, the kind of game of chicken uh, story, because the worse that Brexit looks here, uh, the more deterrence there is to people who think in other countries, in France, in the Front National, uh, or in Germany, in the AfD, or the True Finns, or the Freedom Party in the Netherlands, uh, that, that they will actually be deterred uh, by a bad experience in Brexit. And so the, 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 there may be really a, a kind of vicious political spiral here. We have vicious financial spirals, but we have vicious uh, uh, political spirals where the Europeans want Britain to look very bad and Britain wants Europe to look very bad because you know, both sides will convince their electors that way. And that's the way to catastrophe. So we really, really want to get out of those vicious political spirals. Let me address uh, the, the issue about legacy versus stock versus flow, essentially. What are the past stock problems and what are the flow problems? I think, in general, there are two ways to deal with it. That makes a transition period. So even if you know the ideal framework down the road, it's very hard to get there through the optimal transition periods. So typically, I think there would be a more agreement if there's under the veil of ignorance there's an ins insurance arrangement you don't know who will be the winner who will be the loser and if even more that's what we argue in the book if this insurance is from person to person like to some social insurance or unemployment insurance or something rather than from government to government okay uh, of course you have the stock problem and I think even the stock problem is it's a big problem it's a big obstacle but the Germans if it's a one-term transfer it would not be the main problem. The fear is it will be a permanent transfer. So it's not an insurance arrangement, it's not a one-time transfer to get rid of the legacy problem, it's a permanent transfer, and you end up something with, like in Italy, we have the south and the north, you have essentially a productive north and a less productive south, and then the smart people and productive people that move to the north and work there, and then transfer back to the south. And we don't want to generate a Europe where you have a productive core 
and the less productive periphery, and then all the people who want to achieve something, the move to the core will be active, pay taxes there, and the south will be, or the periphery will be constantly dependent on the core. I think this would be a very unhealthy Europe, and that's something which is a big danger one has to be aware of if we move more to transfer union, and I think that's one thing the Germans are very afraid of, that you know you transform the whole thing in a permanent transfer union. I think even if it's a one-time transfer, just get rid of the legacy problems, it's not the worst thing. The worst thing would be a permanent transfer union from a German perspective. Um, hi, my name is Sima. I'm studying at LSE. Uh, my question is, as you mentioned, the trilemma, uh, countries are limited to limited their freedom to um, use their monetary p policies in Eurozone. And do you think the countries like Greece, it will be good for them to stay in the Eurozone in the, in the long run? Um, Alan Brenner from the law faculties at UCL and Queen Mary's. Uh, is it the case that uh, bail-in would actually work in a systemic crisis? Tom Huertas believes it only really works in a idiosyncratic um, uh, set of circumstances, such as in Cyprus. Hi, my name is Nico. I'm um, a master's student at LSE. And um, I have a question about SBs. Um, you said that if some countries default, the junior bonds protect the senior bonds. And my question is, as this reminds me a bit of the ABS crisis, whether, um, like, default um, probabilities, the correlation of default probabilities is not driven up at that moment, and um, whether politics would not interfere in such a scenario where different countries in the European Union default. So we have, I'm going to stop here so that they have a chance to answer, and then I have three or four more questions I've seen you, but let them answer first, and then we'll do a final round. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, first, the, the, the question on Greece and the euro. Uh, I mean, it's actually a very good instance of a number of problems and uh, issues. Um, I mean, this was a very acute issue, I think. And you know, there was an enormous adjustment that was required in terms of, of wages in, 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 in Greece. Uh, but quite a lot of that adjustment has taken place. And so by now, uh, there's a really strong opinion among the uh, Greek population that they don't want to leave the euro. Um, so last year there was a referendum about the austerity measures and the majority, overwhelming majority, voted against the austerity measures, but at the same time it was clear that the majority of the population wanted to stay in the euro, and these were really incompatible with each other. And I, 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 th I think that's, that's where it is now. I mean, if you want a better trajectory, it might have been better at the beginning if there had been an exit from the euro. Uh, but at this stage, it really doesn't make any sense, and uh, th there's pretty big political commitment in Greece and outside to, to keep Greece in the euro. Um, you, you want to? Yes, yeah, so let mm. me just add one more sentence to Greece. Mm. I think um, if you look at the European integration process, it's also the case that stronger institutions are brought to various countries through the European integration. Now, many of these countries you know, had coups and they have dictatorship and then Europe was something to look up to and that helped to build up stronger institutions. And you can see something, if Greece stays in the Euro, it will be forced to have strong institutions to do some fundamental reforms and this. It will, it's very hard, but it actually, the, it will help to bring on many Greek people understand this and they're afraid, you know, if they were to exit, that, you know, their own political leadership might actually go away from strong institutions. Of course, I understand fully by making the statement, there has to be some ownership of this, you know, new institutional arrangement, but I think Europe is helpful in this regard and leaving the euro, of course, you have the advantage of getting a currency revaluation, re but you have to trade it off with stronger institutions and building up a fundamentally stronger uh, framework. About the bail-in question about systemic versus idiosyncratic, it was not clear when Cyprus was whether it's uh, systemic or not. That was a big debate. Will it be systemic or not? But in general, uh, the, even the new rule book 
which is you know which was decided upon there is a systemic exemption so if there is a systemic event so if a big bank would go would go under or if you know there's some crisis coming from outside and the whole banking system would go under then there would be an exemption you can do some bailout and many people argued brexit was such a systemic event we should have used this as an excuse now we use a systemic exemption and recapitalize italian banks okay and some people say oh this was a missed opportunity uh, the Germans were concerned, oh, if you use this exemption right away, this, everything will be an exemption. But there is, of course, the rules are flexible enough in this regard. On the ESPs, and Ricardo probably can answer this too, uh, we did a lot of simulations, and uh, we actually did a lot of correlations, and we assumed that correlations are going up in times of crisis, very dramatically. Um, the one way to see it, if you have a junior tranche, a junior bond of 30% and a senior bond of 70%, if you assume the worst case that all countries default, which have a lower rating than France, Spain, Italy, Greece, I mean Greece, Portugal, they are too small to make a big impact. It would be really Spain, Italy, all of them which have a lower rating than France, except for France, you still don't touch this senior bond. It's all absorbed by the junior bond. It's only once France defaults, then it's a problem. Okay. So that's essentially, I think it's very it's conservative. So if you design it this way, that you make a junior bond of 30% and a senior bond of 70%, it's very conservative. And essentially, the, the question had two components. One was the political interference. Of course, if countries default, there is a question, will then you know, the issue of the SPs then intervene and bail out the junior bondholders and things like that. But that's an institutional arrangement one has to find. And then the question is, will the ESPs be issued by private entities or public entities, and how much of an arm's length relationship you want to build in order to avoid some hidden bailouts? That's what the Germans are concerned about, okay? that there will be some hidden mutualization uh, going through on the ESPs. But the beauty of the scheme is essentially, it's essentially not a euro bond. It is no mutualization. It is purely tranche, pooling and tranching. Very good. So a very final round, so I'd ask you to be brief. So I have the gentleman over there, gentleman over there, and over there, and over there. Those are the four. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't go to the one. You, so let's start with the one there. You've got the Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm from the College of Europe. Yeah, that's I'm interested in the ideas divide and the Rhine divide and where you place the ECB on that, that divide, as I think the ECD's, ECB's ideological framework is not necessarily completely coherently on one side of that position or another. Their position, for example, on uh, liquidity verse in, with, in 2012 versus their position on sovereign bond risk weighting is not necessarily on w only in one camp and whether there is in fact another position that exists only on the mine. So up there, please. Um, hi, I'm Sam. Um, Sam Lane from uh, Dr. Jones Grammar School. But um, the question I have is, how do you think Germany, especially, his policy will change in the future? Because, as you've shown, they don't believe in bailouts generally, but we've seen how they've bailed out Greece in the past. So how do you think it will change in the future, and maybe other European nations if you have time? Yeah, uh, my name... Can I go? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. My name is Gianluca. I'm Italian. So I, I listen to a professor that he talks quite often about the privatization of the, the bank in Italy. So and uh, I'm following a kind of policy that the prime minister is keep asking to the Germany about more flexibility for the earthquake in Italy or other kind of big issue. Uh, my point is there is a huge dilemma about the austerity uh, or to be more flexible. Uh, what do you think about, because uh, austerity, I think, is the, the main issue in all this kind of situation, and even the privatization of the bank, I don't know if it's going to be a kind of uh, uh, solution for this problem. And finally, up there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Angelo Martelli, PhD candidate here at the LSE. Um, actually, don't you think that there has been some institution building, especially after the 2012 president report and then the five presidents report? And uh, just to follow up on the ECB question, don't you think actually there, there has been a power shift also towards the, the ECB in this sense? So it's not only the German, the Franco-German duopoly that plays a role, but it's also a powerful actor right now, the central bank uh, playing a role. Thank you. So final round. 
Right. Uh, I mean, on the last point, it's, uh, th that's very good and very important, uh, that the e ECB is actually very much part of this dynamic. And uh, we, we have a lot of discussion of the post-July 2012 uh, uh, measures. But I think if you want to see how it fits into the picture, one of the German obsessions after the Second World War is with the independence of the central bank. And the Bundesbank is always the highly rated German institution. Uh, so what happened was then that the principle of an independent central bank is transferred to the European level, and it's designed to be as much like the Bundesbank as possible. But in the Bundesbank, you know, if you look back on the history of the old Federal Republic, it was repeatedly criticized by, by the chancellors, by Adenauer, by Helmut Schmidt, and so on. And so at the moment, uh, the many people in the German political establishment are criticizing the ECB for the quantitative easing or for the low interest rates, the negative interest rates. Uh, but that's actually standard. I think you have to understand that as part of the German political game. And so in that sense, you know, the ECB is, is, is a version of what we're thinking of in terms of insurance-like institutions that, that really get, get, get out of the, the difficulty. Um, I, I, I mean, the Italian uh, uh, problem and the debate on austerity or um, uh, fic fiscal relaxation, you know, that's where I think the, the multiple element of the current crisis is, is important because we've already seen with Spain and Portugal that uh, Germany is supportive of a stance where they don't get penalized for, for running their deficits, and it's treated as a kind of emergency situation. Um, Italy and Greece are on the forefront of the refugee issue. Um, Italy is on the forefront of the bank issue at the moment. Um, the, the, bailout, uh, the, 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 the bailout situation is, is excluded now and because of the logic that Marcus was explaining. So you, you need some economic growth in Italy if you want the banks to recover. Where's it going to come from? I mean, it can come, and that's the, the kind of hope on which Renzi is pinning his strategy uh, from European investment projects, and uh, they will be partly private, partly public, but, but, but that's, that's the, 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 the way out of this, uh, this, this dilemma. Italy is clearly a country in need of an enormous amount of institutional reform, and the timing of reform it has always been a critical part of the Italian debate. Um, uh, the, the, the question from the balcony about uh, Germany changing its course, uh, well, I think you, you, you see something of this rethinking in, in Germany, and you know, in a sense the ECB question was a, was a reply to that. Okay, so let me go on the order where the questions came. So first, risk weights and liquidity versus solvency, it's indeed consistent. So if you think it's mostly a liquidity problem and you will stand up for liquidity problems, then you don't need any risk weights because you know it's all a liquidity problem. We don't have to restructure anyway. We just have a big bazooka and we solve these problems. And then I have a zero risk weight policy, easy way to go. And that's going back to the old regime uh, where you, only, you, know, you don't take the no bailout clause very seriously. You just put zero risk weights and think sovereign debt will never default. Uh, bailout, in the past, it's indeed the case, I mean, Germany bailed out these banks too. You might say, oh, there might be some inconsistency in, in, with regard to the German policy. And there is some inconsistency because Germany was putting a lot of money into their banking system to bail out the banks. The problem the Germans have essentially is that Germany is saving a lot abroad and they are investing, the banks are investing abroad with very low returns. So all the German savers bring it to their savings bank, and the German banks invest, you know, two-thirds of the savings goes abroad with very low returns, and this brings actually the banks into difficulties. So all the surplus that Germ Germany generates is not actually uh, making the banking system stable, and that's systemically what causes the banks to be weak uh, in the long run. On Italy, um, Yes, I mean, so in the book we say okay, we would like to have much more automatic stabilizers, so rules essentially how to stabilize automatically, in, in more generically on, uh, on this. We also think, as Harold said, if there are very specific things, I think it's much easier to convince the German public there should be some transfers or payments. So if there's an earthquake in, in Italy, 
But then it's much more easy to help out and do something. If there is a refugee crisis, the pol political landscape will be very different, and Germany and Italy and Greece will be aligned on this dimension. There will be much more help, and it will be much easier to tell the German public, you know, something needs to be done, because otherwise they all come to Germany, and we have to help out the Italians. And I think that's, I think that's why the multiple facets of the crisis helps. And on the institution building, indeed, the, this question was two parts. Yes, a lot of these institutions were put in place, the EFSF, the ESM, and all that. And indeed, a lot of the French perspective came to play there. The liquidity perspective came to play there. And Germany was always holding back. But uh, you know, at the end, the institutions were put in place. And the ECB played a crit critical role. It also plays some intermediary role, because you know, it is between the two. And it, we also describe in the book how the power, the only European entity which gained a lot in power was essentially the ECB. The ECB gained a lot in stature and in power uh, playing this role, and the whole chapter is de dedicated to that. It's also what's the philosophy of the ECB with respect to debt restructuring and all this. So that's all in the you know, chapter 15. You can read when you buy the book uh, how you know, the ECB played this major role, important role in the Euro crisis, more than, than other European institutions. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time in what has been a truly fascinating discussion and multifaceted, too. So um, I remind you that you can buy the book outside and that the authors will be here down the stairs to talk for the many who, wanted to, who had questions that we didn't get to. And the last thing is to thank them very much for coming and for this lovely time. <laughs>